I do want to talk about frustration some today because there is uh, it's something that we all, I think, experience. We all feel. We all feel to differing levels and, and different degrees and, and frustrated by different things. And uh, I, I know one of the, the, when I got on the police department back in 1996 and going through the interview process and they ask you every step of the line of the way, they ask you, why do you want to be a police officer? And it's it's like kind of a joke that everybody responds with the, uh, this idea of, I just want to help people. And, and they kind of expect that out of every person that comes through. I just want to help people. And then you ask an officer who's been on for 10 years that, you know, what they're, why they want to be an officer. And it, the answers usually change because, unfortunately, uh, you, you discover that helping people as an officer is is we just run around and put band-aids on problems. We never got to the core issue of what the problem was and we only had a few minutes to deal with each situation and so you run by, you slap a band-aid on there and then you keep going and so it, it becomes a very frustrating job at times trying to determine how is it that you get to the root of the problem and fix this and so that it's not a recurring issue and, and uh, and it's not just uh, solved for the hour by an arrest or something along those lines. And we, uh, you, you discover that an external fix is very frustrating. And, uh, and that's what I want to talk about today. So let's pray. Our dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you again, Lord, that you brought us together. And uh, Lord, whatever we are on our journey, I, I pray that your words would be spoken today, that where... Uh, where I stumble and fall, that you would bring clarity and precision and you would drive your point home to the hearts that need to hear it this morning. Lord, we thank you again. We, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we talked about uh, this idea. We said that, that trouble is going to come into your life. And, and when you get the attention of God, then you also get the attention of the enemy. And so that brings a lot of issues and problems and struggles to your life. But sometimes the struggles in your life are just because you're making stupid choices. And, and that seemed to resonate with some people last week. They, they understood that, that when we make bad choices, then it has repercussions on our life. And, and so, uh, again, it, it creates frustration. And even whether it's the enemy coming at us or whether it's our own silly mistakes that we're making, it creates that that atmosphere of frustration. Now, there are uh, a lot of things that that can cause frustration. We can, we can deal with uh, events sometimes cause frustration. I mean, let's face it, we live in a broken world. And, and things happen sometimes that are beyond anybody's control and they frustrate us. Uh, and let me, let me make sure I'm not way off base here. When I talk about being frustrated is there anybody that can be that can relate in here about frustration? I just want to make sure I'm talking to the right people. Because events sometimes can happen, and, and events can frustrate us. And, and you know, whether they're, they're, they're things that are just unavoidable, it's not something that's necessarily caused by man. But uh, I don't know if you've heard the phrase that that it's 10% of what happens to us and 90% of how we respond. And so the frustration isn't necessarily in the event. The frustration is in our response. And then there's a lot of those, those events that sometimes are man-made events. In which case, both cases really, our problem, our frustration comes from people. Whether it's how we're responding to something or whether it's because somebody else caused an event or whether it's because somebody else's actions, we get frustrated with people. And people gets broken down into two categories. Number one is self. We get frustrated with ourselves. Sometimes we don't like to admit that. Sometimes we want to shift the blame, blame somebody else, kind of that old Adam uh, idea in the book of Genesis when God comes down and asks Adam, what'd you do? And he said, hey, it's the woman that did it. And, and it's not just the woman, it's the woman you gave me that did it. So really, the two of you need to work this out. <laughs> it's not my fault. But we're really frustrated with ourselves. We get upset that we are not the people that we want to be. 
And, and scripture plays this out. Paul talks about this beautifully and he talks about it in the, in the book of Romans. And he says, but what I'm doing, I don't understand. But I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing that I hate. Uh, for the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want to do. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Frustration. And, and again, we all, I think, can understand that to a degree of, this is what I want to do, and, and yet I don't do it. And, but I, I, I definitely don't want to do this, but I keep getting sucked in and doing this. You know, it, it, and it reaches the gamut. Whether it's you're sitting at the restaurant and they come up and they say, would you like dessert? And you think no, and you go, yes. <laughs> or whether it's, it's, a, it's a bottle, or whether it's a relationship, or whether it's a, a, a pornography, or shopping, or eating. It's, it reaches all across our lives, into every corner. I think we fully understand frustration and that we're not the people that we want to be. But then, the easy part is when it's other people frustrate us, right? Can I get an amen to that? Because we don't like to talk about ourselves so much. But boy, when other people frustrate us, I mean, we, we get in our car and immediately we just might as well write frustration all over our car because it doesn't matter what, it could be three o'clock in the morning, you might have to stop for two seconds for another car, but oh, they're in your way. Right? Go to the grocery store, and no matter which line you pick, it's the slowest one. <laughs> Go to the restaurant, and they take too long with your food. They don't cook your food the right way. Uh, how many of you showed up to church this morning and somebody was sitting in your seat? <laughs> I've heard of church splits over that kind of stuff. Your family, your family messing up can be a, a real source of frustration. And maybe your boss is a tyrant. Maybe your employees are lazy. Uh, maybe your spouse is hard-headed. Maybe it's all of these things. Maybe your kids are incessant. Frustration is common. We all understand it. We all get it. And, and we sit to, and start to, to describe it. And, and I'm sure every one of you have got an event or a person or something in your mind of what frustrates you. You just want to grind your teeth down when you think about it. But I want to look and see what God says about frustration. Because that's certainly, if we're, if we're in church and in the context of, of Jesus Christ, and we want to look at this, then we need to understand what is it that God says about frustration. And if we look at this word frustrate in Scripture, it comes from this word that means broken. Now, how many times have we talked about broken? We live in a broken world. Because of the events of Genesis chapter 3, we are all broken. And usually in Scripture, when this word is used, it's talking about breaking the commandments of God. Breaking the things that God wants for us in our life. And so, really, if we, we kind of draw this out, we can see where that is absolutely true. Not that we need to understand it for it to be true because God says it and so it, it, it is. But it makes perfect sense. That the things that frustrate us are the things that break God's commandments. It usually initiates from something that is uh, uh, against God's desire, uh, like an injustice. Maybe it's uh, something unloving that happened. It's lies from someone. Uh, it's gossip, uh, destruction, drunkenness, immorality, unfaithfulness. All of these things that create frustration in our lives are the things that God has said, don't do these things. And even in our own selves, our own bodies, the frustrations that we deal with, we see where that plays out as well. God says, I want better for you, don't do these things. And, and we don't do those things that we want to do but honor God, we get frustrated. And when God says, don't do these things, and then we do them anyway, then we get frustrated. 
Frustration spawns something. It spawns a reaction. Every time that we feel it, frustration has a result in us. And, and I think we can boil it down to either a, a retaliation or a remedy. Frustration causes us to, to usually, many times, we retaliate. Once we start to feel this, then, then, then we burst forth in anger. We want to get angry at somebody when we're frustrated, whether it's in traffic, and so we start waving at them, but we don't use all of our fingers. <laughs> or, or whether we shout at somebody, or we're cussing at somebody, or, or, or we're just grinding our teeth about somebody, there's this anger that wells up because of frustration sometimes. And, and sometimes it, it spills over into a hatred. And certainly these things are against God's will. And then maybe sometimes we, we, we shy so far away from, from anger and hatred that we fall on this other side where we just become apathetic. I'm so frustrated that I, I just don't even want to care about this situation. I'm not going to deal with it. It doesn't even exist. I'm going to pretend it's not there. And we don't care one way or another what happens beyond this veil that we've put up. The bad thing about that is Edmund Burke, and I love this quote, I love it, and I know it's used in all kinds of different contexts, but it's so true. It says, all that's necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. And so oftentimes that's what we've decided. And, and, and the things of the world that bother us, we don't do anything about it, and then evil triumphs. People of God don't stand up for what God desires and evil triumphs. Apathy is not the result, or, or not the, the, the result that God wants from us. Sometimes when we, we experience these things of hatred and anger and, and, and frustration, it spills over into prejudice. And we start looking and, and defining uh, jobs or people or religions or, or sexual orientations or color of skin or we take and we define these people in one single way and, and, and we just put this ignorance and this hatred on everybody that falls into that category. And that's, that's finding an ember that's finding one thing that you don't like and one person that you don't like and then just adding fuel and ignorance to it. Prejudice is, is an ultimate form of self-hatred and laziness. The other option, which God certainly wants us to do, the other option, if we, if we uh, instead of retaliating against frustration, we decide, oh, we're going to fix this. We're going to remedy the frustration instead of retaliate. And so what we decide, we, we set out to remedy, which is a good goal, but the problem is we often go in the wrong direction of the remedy. We focus on the exterior. And so many times we're telling people when we get frustrated, hey, stop doing what you're doing and act like me. <laughs> then everything will be good. The world would be right if everybody would just act like me. But wait a minute, didn't we just say a few minutes ago that I frustrate myself? And so now if we're telling everybody else to act like me, they're still going to frustrate me because I frustrate myself. And so we need to find some other pivot point, some other focal point, to be. And so then we say, oh, okay, then, then act like a Christian. Act like a Christian. Don't act like me. Act like a Christian. And Jesus addresses this in the book of Matthew. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they're full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like the whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly 
You're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. See, this is what we often try to do in our culture. We want to tell people how to act. Hey, act right. Listen, you, 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 we, then we go to the, so far as to legislate it. We want to make laws. We want to go, okay, it's now a law that you have to act like a Christian. And we do that through things where rather than laws, and I'm not, don't take my statements as about whether we should or shouldn't on the laws, okay? But we lean so far on the laws that we forget the humanity aspect behind it. We want to make a law against abortion, which I agree 100% that abortion is wrong, but we're so worried about legislating it that we're forgetting the women behind it and loving them and going to them and helping them heal. We're so involved in legislating homosexual marriage that we forget that there's people behind that. Real people. And again, we fall into this, and Christians so often fall into this category of we're just going to label that as a group and create this prejudice based on ignorance and self-hatred. We need to avoid that and not go into this idea of, of legislating Christian activity. And we do it in our workplaces and with our friends. And, and you know, you go to somebody who's a non-believer and, and their mouth is going like a sailor. And what do we always want to say? Hey, listen, do me a favor. Don't talk like that around me. What are we telling them? Don't be yourself around me. Pretend to be somebody else around me. And then when I go away, be yourself. We're worried about the outside and not the inside. We're worried about what it looks like as opposed to who the person is in their heart. We say, act like a Christian. We're calling them to be actors. Do you know what the Hebrew word is for actor? Hypocrite. That's the Hebrew word for actor, is a hypocrite. So when we're telling people, hey listen, I don't want to know who you really are, Just act like I want you to act. Act like what I think you're supposed to act like. And so we need to actually get beyond the exterior fix and we get, need to get to the interior fix. And we need to not tell people to act like Christians. We need to tell people and, and invite people to be like Christ. Not act like Christians, be like Christ. We need to be worried, more worried about them internally and then allow God and the Holy Spirit to work on the external. We need to help them get the inside of the dish clean, lead them to that point where God can do that, and then allow Him to do the rest. Because when we be, when we become like Christ, when we are transformed to be like Jesus, then our lives change. And then it's an internal thing, and it's not a source of frustration, because if you change the external, we've all changed the external. We've all come to church, and we put on our happy faces. And how many of you get in your car sometimes on Sunday when you really don't feel like putting on your happy face, and you're really not happy, and you're really upset, and you come in here, and you put on your happy face for everybody, your Sunday best smile, and then you get in your church, and you... Ah, you're just so glad that the service is over so you, now you can be yourself. Now listen, we should be striving constantly. If we have Christ in our heart, we should be striving for that change. Real change, but not frustrating change. Not change that's going to say that, that this isn't who I am. We should change who we are on the inside and so that the, what we become on the outside isn't a source of frustration. We need to show that heaven starts within. Jesus tells us that. Heaven starts within. It starts with the seed inside and it grows in us. It, begins with, it, 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 in, it infuses our integrity. It ushers forth from our heart. So, so here's some, some logical conclusions from this idea. Frustrated with ourselves, that means that uh, these external fixes that we are get so frustrated with, we, we put these laws on ourselves, and it becomes a source of stress. It becomes a source of, of irritation. It becomes a source of, uh, it's a burden. So 
why is it that we think that if we put that on somebody else, it's going to work for them? Why if we put that external stress on somebody else, is it going to work for them? We know that for true peace within ourselves, we need to persevere, like we talked about last week, and we need to foster an understanding and a love of Christ. And here's the frustrating part, is that is a much slower process. It's much easier to tell somebody, hey, listen, just stop. Stop doing that. Maybe sometime later, then Christ can enter your heart. But it's a very frustrating thing to allow the process of Christ entering somebody's heart and changing their lives. That's permanent. And if the understanding and an experience of Christ is the answer for us, inside of us, and to make us authentic and real and, and, and not fill into that frustration, then isn't that the same answer for everybody else? If we all become internally tuned to the one true God, if all of us would, would not be like Brian or be like any other person or, or like our superstar or... If we would all be like Christ, then we all become tuned to the one true God. Then the frustration of this world would begin to dissipate and disappear. We would all be living by the same love and the same rules and the same desire to please God. And, and all the, the things like the lies, they would start to fall off. And, and, and the unfaithfulness and the... And the and we would start seeing things like love and service and kindness and, and faithfulness and, and self-control and, and these things that, that don't cause frustration. You know, when you go to an orchestra, they have all these different instruments. And they don't, I don't know how the band does it, but, but they don't sit up there and each tune their own instrument individually. Apparently, what happens is the oboe player, he plays his oboe, and the entire orchestra tunes off of the oboe. The entire orchestra becomes in tune because they all focus on that oboe. And if we could all focus on Jesus Christ, then we all become of one accord. Then we all become in agreement. And this leads to two conclusions. Number one is grace. Grace, grace, and grace. An abundance of grace. We need to allow, I mean, God has showered grace down upon us. God's gift to us is, is grace. And in the midst of, of Everything that we don't deserve, He has given us Jesus Christ. Everything that we don't deserve, He has given us an eternity in heaven. Everything that we don't deserve, God has shown us and given us a throne in heaven, a kingship, a priesthood. He's giving these things to us. That's grace. We don't deserve that. So for ourselves, we need to allow some grace. We need to, to, to look within ourselves and, 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 uh, and allow ourselves this process of change. Not sitting back, but working towards that. And we certainly need to allow it for people around us. If the people around us are, are we need to tell them the truth about Jesus Christ. We need to tell them and, and give them an understanding and so God can lead them in that. And we need to give an abundant amount of grace, but Grace is one of, the, it's the, one of the focal points of Christianity. It's one of the focal points of our faith and it's one of the things that we fail to practice most as Christians. Allowing grace for your brothers and your sisters. Allowing them to mess up and still loving them. Matthew 18 tells a story about a debtor who goes and, and, and the Lord of the debtor, he says, hey, listen, time to pay up on your debts. 
And he says, Lord, I don't have it. I don't have it. I'm so sorry. And he says, well, if you don't have it, I'm going to take him. I'm going to throw you in jail. I'm going to take your wife and kids. And, and he says, Lord, I don't have it. I'm so sorry. And the Lord said, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll pardon him. I'll pardon your debts. And so the, the servant was so happy, you know, he left the presence of the Lord. And then he goes to the guy who owes him money. He goes, hey, pay up. You owe me some money. And the guy says, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't have it. And he takes the guy and he th has him thrown in jail. The grace that was given to him, he refused to give to anybody else. The grace that is given to us by God, we are supposed to take and, and just revel in the opportunity to shower it on others. We're supposed to enjoy that. So that's the first conclusion that we come to. And the second one, I want to close with this idea and I want to expand on it next week, is evangelism. Now somehow evangelism has taken on a negative connotation in some circles. And I don't know how that is. I don't know what the temperature is when I say the word evangelism to you. And I don't know if we, we see the connection of how evangelism helps with this problem of frustration. But in order for the world to get in tune with, with Jesus Christ, uh, like an orchestra to be playing one tune, then we all have to know about the one Jesus Christ. That's our job with evangelism. Billy Graham said, The greatest form of praise is the sound of consecrated feet seeking out the lost and the helpless. Seeking out the lost and the helpless. We're not special because we understand and believe in Jesus Christ. We're blessed. But it doesn't make us any better. It's our jobs now to, to share that. And... and one theologian said, it's just like a, a beggar sharing a piece of bread with another beggar. We have that piece of bread to share. Last week we said, hey, you know, sometimes when we step out and you start to evangelize, we become under attack by the enemy, and I would rather put on my camouflage and stand in the background. Makes life much easier. That's not what we're called to do. In the camouflage, there's frustration. In the camouflage, there's not the blessing of God. We're supposed to stand out, marked by God, and tell other people about Him. I'm going to close with this quote and let you think about this for the next seven days until we gather again and talk a little bit more about this idea. Charles Spurgeon said, Have you no wish for others to be saved? then you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. Pretty challenging thought. Pray with me. Our dear Lord, we thank you for gathering us together. Lord, we thank you that somebody in our lives had the, the obedience within them, the desire to, to tell us about Christ, to invite us to church, to, to love us, Lord, we thank you that we've been the recipient of your grace. Lord, we want to be that instrument in your hand that is tuned to your perfect will and play that music to the world around us. Lord, we want to share the beauty, the good news of who you are and what you've done and just spread it, Lord. Share it with the world. Lord, give us the strength, the, the courage to do that. Help us to understand we don't need a, a PhD to go out and, and share the name of Jesus. Help us to understand that when there's a, our favorite restaurant, we don't need to know every ingredient. We just tell people it's good. We just need to tell people Jesus is good. Lord, strengthen us. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.